Uh, my name is Tim McCarthy. Uh, I uh, teach on the faculty at Harvard University. I'm a program director of the Carr Center for Human Rights Policy at the Harvard Kennedy School. But more important for this gathering, uh, I was a graduate student at Manning's here in the 90s and early aughts. And uh, it's a little weird to be in this space because a number of us actually took over this building during the ethnic studies struggles in the 90s at Columbia. It's a little strange to be back here in an official capacity. <laughs> <laughs> Johanna, Johanna and I were both here. Uh, I remember we slept over, we were grading papers, I think, while we were taking over the building. So it's nice to be at the center of the university, finally. Uh, too bad it took this long. Uh, I'd like to just, uh, I'm gonna moderate this panel here, a new vision for freedom. But before um, going any further, I wanted to just thank the planners of this conference, my sister Johanna Fernandez, who went to graduate school with me, Russell Rickford, uh, and Robin Spencer, and all the folks who have put together this conference. This was a, a germ of an idea a year ago and has now become this great vision that's now been implemented. And I just wanted to say how honored I am to just be here and how humbled I am to be uh, along with you in a small capacity on this journey. So thank you so much for this, because Manning would have loved this. I also wanted to say um, one thing. It's, it's weird. I, I did not enjoy my Columbia experience. There are many of us in graduate school who did not necessarily enjoy our Columbia experiences, but for Manning. <laughs> thank God for Manning. Uh, and it's strange because this was a place of struggle for many of us political struggle, intellectual struggle, personal struggle, spiritual struggle. And with his passing, this place has transformed, at least for me, into something of a sacred space. This is a place now where I can come back and pay respects, pay my respects to the person who made this place bearable at times and who supported many, many of us when other folks did not. And so in the interest of it being a sacred space, I just wanted to sort of open with that. Manning Maribel was the first person who really taught me and showed me, like he did many of us, that freedom meant liberation. That freedom wasn't just individual freedom, getting ours, being free from the constraints in our lives, but it was about liberation, collective liberation, from all forms of exclusion and discrimination, poverty, prejudice, and oppression. Manning was someone who insisted that we see the links between individual struggles for freedom and collective struggles for freedom. That freedom struggles existed in local places where we lived, where we worked, and where we loved, but they also existed in global spaces, in places where we had not even yet been in some of our cases. And he also insisted that we had critiques of structures of oppression that we had an intersecting critique of the different kinds of oppressions that bear down on so many of us. One of the things that I loved about Manning is that he insisted always in his writing, in his teaching, and in his life that none of us are free unless all of us are free. And one of the things I also loved about Manning, just give me a moment here, it's my first time back, is how old school he, he seemed all the time. He was kind of an old school cat, as he often referred to himself. And, uh, but he was also one of those old school cats who thought in such radical and progressive ways. He was so far ahead of his time like Du Bois before him. He was so far ahead of his time. He seemed so modern to me all the time. And one of the things that I always appreciated about Manning was that he took in so many of us who didn't really feel at home here. I like to refer to him sometimes, he was like the, the mayor of the island of misfit toys. <laughs> and the institute was a place where so many of us who felt out of place had a place and a home. It was Manning who took me in as a broken down, beaten down white boy. Uh, my nickname at the institute among some of my colleagues was Manning's white hand man. And, uh, and he took me in and he lifted me up as he did so many of us. He was the first of my graduate school mentors that I told that I was queer to. And he was the person who hugged me first and called me doctor when I got my PhD many years after I should have gotten my PhD. <laughs> you see, Manning never batted an eye at those of us who were a bit different, who lived and loved in unorthodox ways who danced to different drummers. And that's because Manning always had his eyes on a much bigger prize, 
on the collective liberation of each and every human being, no matter their color or creed or condition or circumstance. And in fact, he understood deep in his bones that misfits would lead the revolution because misfits have always led the revolution. And like Du Bois before him, Manning was so radical in his thinking, so far ahead of his time, that all of us in some ways are just trying to, to catch up with Brother Manning. Manning also understood the power of revision, not only of revising politics and history, but of constantly rethinking and challenging our old ideas and assumptions, finding new ways of knowing, new ways of thinking and seeing, and most importantly, new ways of acting in the world. And if he were here today, I like to think that he is here today, he would be very excited to hear these brilliant folks beside me. And these are trailblazing scholars and activists, thinkers, cultural workers who help us imagine what a new vision for freedom might look like in these profound and precarious times. And so it is not only my honor to moderate this panel, but to introduce these four remarkable folks. Kathy Cohen is the David and Mary Winton Green Professor of Political Science at the University of Chicago. She has served as Deputy Provost for Graduate Education and is the former director of the Center for the Study of Race, Politics, and Culture at Chicago. Professor Cohen is the author of two brilliant, in my opinion, brilliant and acclaimed books, Democracy Remixed, Black Youth, and the Future of American Politics, and the Boundaries of Blackness, AIDS and the Breakdown of Black Politics. She's also co-editor of Women Transforming Politics, an alternative reader. Her work has been published in numerous journals and edited volumes, including the American Political Science Review, Gay and Lesbian Quarterly, and Social Text. Professor Cohen is principal investigator on two major research projects, the Black Youth Project and the Mobilization, Change, and Political and Civic Engagement Project. Her general field of specialization is American politics, but her research interests include African American politics, women in politics, lesbian and gay politics, and social movements. Kenyon Farrow has been working as an organizer, communications strategist, and writer on issues at the intersection of HIV, AIDS, prisons, and homophobia. Kenyon is the former executive director of Queers for Economic Justice, an organization dedicated to organizing research and advocacy for and with low-income and working-class LGBTQ folks. Prior to becoming the executive director, Kenyon served as the national public education director, building the visibility of progressive racial and economic justice issues as they pertain to the LGBTQ community through coalition building public education and media advocacy currently serves in the executive committee of Connect to Protect New York and the Center for Gay and Lesbian Studies. He was also a Policy Institute Fellow with the National Gay and Lesbian Task Force, doing research, writing, and advocating for new approaches to the HIV AIDS epidemic in black gay men in the U.S. And he's co-editor of Letters from Young Activists, Today's Rebels Speak Out, and the upcoming A New Queer Agenda, and also Stand Up, The Politics of Racial Uplift. Rhonda Williams is Associate Professor of History at Case Western Reserve University, where she is also founding director of the Postdoctoral Fellowship in African American Studies and director of Case Western's Social Justice Institute. The award-winning author of The Politics of Public Housing, Black Women's Struggles Against Urban Inequality, Professor Williams has been honored by History News Network as a top young historian and is listed in the 2009 edition of Who's Who in Black Cleveland. Her research interests include the manifestations of race and gender inequality in urban space and policy, the history of low-income people's lives and activism, and illicit narcotics economies in the post-1940s United States. Professor Williams is a recipient of the American Association of University Women Postdoctoral Fellowship and a former Harvard University Du Bois Institute Fellow. And she is co-editor of the recently launched book series, Justice, Power, and Politics, with the University of North Carolina Press. She received her PhD in history from the University of Pennsylvania in 1998 and her undergraduate degree in journalism from the University of Maryland at College Park, where she became the university's first black salutatorian in its 187 year history. Her publications include articles on black power politics, the war on poverty, low income, black women's grassroots organizing, and urban and housing policy. And last but certainly not least is Loretta Ross, 
Loretta Ross is a founder and national coordinator of the Sister Song Women of Color Reproductive Health Collective, composed of 70 women of color organizations across the country. She was co-director of the 2004 National March for Women's Lives in Washington, D.C., which is the largest protest in U.S. history. She's also the co-author of Undivided Right, Women of Color Organizing for Reproductive Justice, and Beyond the Politics of Inclusion, Women of Color and the Reproductive Rights Movement. A leading expert on reproductive rights, human rights, women's rights, diversity issues, hate crimes, and hate groups. She is the founder and former executive director of the National Center for Human Rights Education, a training and resource center for grassroots activists on using human rights education to address social injustices in the United States. Prior to that, from 1990 to 95, she served as the National Program Research Director for the Atlanta-based Center for Democratic Renewal, a national nonprofit organization for information on hate groups and bigoted violence, including the KKK and the neo-Nazi movement. She was also the first African-American woman to direct a rape crisis center in the United States in the 1970s. She's a frequent media commentator and recently has been collecting oral histories of elder feminists of color for archives at Smith College. This is uh, clearly a stunning group of folks to help us reimagine uh, a new vision for freedom. And I, with that, I will pass it over to Kathy. Thank you. All right. Thank you, Tim. How's everybody doing? All right. All right there you go. Um, I want to also thank the uh, conference planners for this heroic work uh, and very important work it is. I think for all of us, incredibly meaningful to be here uh, in honor of Manning. For me, he was the model of what it is to live a life partly in the academy and transform that work into work that was a, really about liberation. And so um, it's, it's a very special moment uh, to be here for him and with him. OK, so uh, last night I flew in from New Orleans, where I was attending a conference planned by the Kellogg Foundation entitled Racial Healing. Uh, in fact, the name of the conference was something like America Healing. Now, as you might expect, I went there with what my mother called a bad attitude. Uh, I, I kind of stepped off the plane making comments like, you see, this is what happens when you elect your first black president. Now you got to go to New Orleans and heal white supremacy. Um, <laughs> interestingly, I have to say, as the discussion proceeded and kind of speaker after speaker highlighted not only the structural damage that people of color and poor people have endured, but also the emotional and psychological battles that we have endured for our humanity, I was reminded really of the expansive nature of our struggle and the need to have an expansive vision of freedom today. My concern really stems from the fact that I think far too often, at least for me, when asked about my vision of freedom, my response is focused on the elimination of oppression. Now, again, don't get me wrong, the struggle against oppression is our path to freedom, but it probably isn't freedom in and of itself. So as I struggle to get in touch with my vision of freedom, I recognize that in my conversations with comrades, as I work to better the lives of black people, of gay people, of young people, of women, right? Uh, I don't actually stop very often to imagine what freedom would look like for all of us. In my classrooms, I'm, I'm careful to make sure my students understand the history of oppression in this country, to understand the ways in which that structural racism works today. I ask these students to, to write and talk about their understanding of this legacy of struggle and how they fit into and extend that work. Ironically and maybe shamefully, I can't remember the last time I actually asked them to tell me their vision of freedom. What is their idea today of a beloved community? So I guess the first point I want to make in terms of a new vision of freedom is that we Louder? Can you not hear me? All right, let me bring this down now, okay. Can you hear me now? All right, all right. So I guess the first point I wanna make in terms of a new vision of freedom is that we actually must make the space to think about freedom, not just about struggle. Mm -hmm. Let me say that I, I really understand that it's difficult to imagine freedom in the face of no jobs 
of a prison industrial complex intent on incarcerating us or our brothers and sisters and significant numbers of our community. Uh, it's tough to think about freedom in the face of cities and states throughout the country enacting some of the most vicious and racist anti-immigrant laws from Arizona to Alabama. I understand that when we see our young people murdered from Darian Albert to Trayvon Martin to Sakia Gunn, it's hard to find the space to get in touch with one's radical thoughts about freedom. In fact, I think sometimes such dreaming actually may seem like a luxury. But I want to suggest instead that our engagement with what is possible, our imagination of lives beyond struggle for ourselves, our community, and humanity is actually a necessity. It's a necessity because our vision of freedom actually should drive the strategy of our struggle and because our vision of freedom should actually rejuvenate our commitment to the struggle and, more importantly, to each other. So over the last few days, when I've tried to think about ideas of freedom, I actually started by referring back to my discussions with young people, uh, young African Americans in particular in Chicago, where I had an opportunity to ask them what they wanted in their lives. What did they hope for? And interestingly, in discussion after discussion, I was actually struck by the restrained yet essential sense of what they wanted. They wanted streets empty of violence so that their kids could actually know what it's like to play outside in front of their houses and on their streets. They wanted school systems that actually educate and don't just discipline their children and themselves. They wanted a job that would bring them not only a decent income, but pride and engagement. They wanted to walk down their streets without being viewed as a suspect by both the police and their black neighbors. In very fundamental ways, I think these young people wanted a sense of belonging. In their visions, visions for the future, I was reminded actually of the beginning pages of Robin Kelly's book, Freedom Dreams. In the introduction of the book, Robin talks about how his mother saw the world through her third eye a focus on the possibility of life. He writes, and I quote, she simply wanted us to live through our third eyes, to see a life as possibility. She wanted us to imagine a world free of patriarchy, a world where gender and sexual relations could be reconstructed. She wanted us to see the poetic and prophetic in the richness of our daily lives. She wanted us to visualize a more expansive, fluid, cosmopolitan definition of blackness to teach us that we were not merely inheritors of a culture, but its markers," end quote. And while the young people I talked with didn't use the language of Robin's mother, or at least the language Robin uses to articulate his mother's vision, their stories and desires seemed to center around a hope or possibility that freedom would provide them with a chance to have a fully expansive and dignified life one that surely would be built around well-established convictions such as equality, but also one that embraced and made central the importance of intimacy, joy, belonging, and being fully seen. Now, let me say that I think it would be a mistake to relegate the issues of joy, intimacy, uh, and sex to the private domain as something less worthy of collective struggle. I worry, actually, that sometimes our movements against systems of oppression, that in our movements we forget that our work is not only about defeating systems, but liberating lives, allowing people the full expression of their humanity. Moreover, when we ignore questions of intimacy, sex, and joy, and defining both our lines of struggle and our ideas of freedom, I think we allow the kind of power of neoliberalism to more fundamentally question the claims we have around sex and race and class and move those into the private domain. So I want to suggest that as we rethink our vision of freedom or maybe just kind of fine tune our ideas about freedom, we would do well to center or highlight the work of those comrades whose lives and work are squarely, I would argue, at the intersection of structure and seemingly private identities and desires. Now, I, I'm not about to suggest that any group of activists have a better articulation of freedom for the 21st century. I'm going to suggest that I'm personally inspired by those young people working through a framework of queer politics, and I've said this before. 
These young people through organizations such as Gender Just, Fierce, the Sylvia Rivera Project, Queers for Economic Justice, are building, I think, an analysis and vision of freedom that is expansive, inclusive, and emphatic uh, to the struggles of those seemingly disconnected from themselves. And I've said this before. For example, these groups of young people have refused to articulate the violence experienced by far too many youth in the forms of, for example, bullying. They refuse to hold on to that framework, divorced from the systemic framework that allows us to also understand and connect the violence that far too many youth of color and youth, queer youth experience more broadly and systematically every day in their neighborhoods, in their schools, and actually in their homes. These activists refuse to collaborate on a project that would address violence through a framework that makes the individual and their behavior labeled label bullying or hate crimes the unit of analysis, ignoring the need for a more systemic level response to the collective and systemic violence against marginalized communities, whether those uh, quote unquote victims or targets are black and or queer. These young people, I think, not only use an intersectional framework for their work, they live an intersectional life, and maybe most importantly, dream an intersectional freedom. These are young people who know that one has to engage in collective struggle to win the space for intimate joy. So when I engage in the process of re-envisioning freedom, I want to start with young queer activists who are committed to an expansive framework of struggle and joy that includes, yes, sex and desire. Now briefly, and maybe in conclusion, I want to offer up another component. How am I doing? Okay, I'm good, okay, yeah, Tim says I'm good, I'm good, all right. Uh, I want to offer up another component of my vision of freedom as we move through the 21st century. And it's the value of, I would call it, radical empathy. Interestingly, when you look up the definition of empathy in Webster's online dictionary, it mentions an imaginative quality that allows one to experience the feelings and thoughts of others. I think we all know that our freedom cannot be won without collaborative work and coalition building. But I want to suggest that our freedom cannot be sustained without a radical empathy that deeply connects us to all beings, not in an instrumental way, but in a way that highlights the fragility of our humanity. I remember experiencing what I might call a deep empathy when I became a parent. During the kind of first few months of being, yes, a mother, uh, there were certain things I was shocked that I just let, literally could not read or write or watch. So if I was searching the channels on television and happened upon a Law and Order episode uh, that was about, for example, child abuse, I literally could not watch the show because of the depths of my empathy or my kind of empathetic impulse. It was just too raw. Right? Suddenly, that child on television or in the paper could have been my vulnerable daughter sleeping in the next room. So I'm suggesting that our vision of freedom might include a deep, radical empathy, one that connects me to communities and struggles, not only because it is kind of the instrumental or even the right thing to do politically, but also because I am deeply connected to the basic desire of people in those movements for the same type of dignity, joy, and freedom that I want. I'm not, again, suggesting a kind of impulse toward radical empathy that will come easily. Uh, you know, it's the metaphor of the muscle that has to be trained. It begins, I think, by pushing myself to have a deeper understanding of and connections to the struggles for freedom currently being waged in communities that seem to be distinct from our own. For example, it might start with understanding and highlighting the ways that racial profiling motivates both the stop and frisk policies of cities like New York and Chicago that I oppose, and that racial profiling allows for the racist immigration laws in Arizona and Alabama that we all should oppose. With that understanding of, I think, our connected enemy and struggle, we might then cross identity lines to actually work together in sustained and creative ways, allowing, uh, allowing our empathy to grow while our ima radical imagination for futures become entwined. 
Here may be, I think, one way to nurture a radical empathy that connects us through practice to not only struggles, but to the people struggling. Now, I want to be clear in conclusion that this really is not a plea toward a kind of post-racial utopia. Uh, I, I wasn't kind of converted when I was at that Kellogg conference, but uh, where kind of only the important aspect of our existence is our human connection. Instead, what I think I'm trying to suggest is that at the heart of our struggles against neoliberalism, we must remember that most people want not only structural liberation, but also personal joy. They want the capacity to live dignified, fulfilled, and empowered lives. Folks want to feel like they belong in their families, those they were born into and those they create. They want to belong in their communities, in their countries, and in the world. And they want to be connected to others through a deep sense of belonging. So I want to close with a quote again from Freedom Dreams because it kind of embodies everything I think I was trying to say. And the quote is this, freedom and love may be the most revolutionary ideas available to us, and yet as intellectuals we have failed miserably to grapple with their political and analytic importance, end quote. Robin goes on to say finally, I have come to realize that once we strip radical social movements down to their bare essence and understand the collective desires of people in motion, freedom and love lay at the heart of the matter." End quote, and thank you. Good afternoon. Um, it's funny that you, um, Kathy, started uh, and, and sort of ended um, talking about um, Robin Kelly's freedom dreams, and I'm also going to talk about Robin Kelly. <laughs> um, Robin, do you want to come up? Right, I know. You'll be, you'll be up here later. Yeah, you can. Right, you'll be up here later. But um, but I, and, and I think actually to talk um, uh, from this question. Um, Thank you. Um, one of the things that I'm, I'm responding to, um, you know, on this panel is this question is a series of articles that was um, published in the Boston Review, you know, kind of about the future of black politics. And um, what I thought was just a really kind of interesting question, a lot of really interesting, um, you know, kind of uh, work and articles came out of that. Um, and. Um, and I was specifically um, interested in several questions uh, that Robin Kelly was raising in the, the piece that he wrote, really sort of focusing um, on, on neoliberalism, kind of shaping um, the way in which sort of black activism and politics currently happen. Um, and so, you know, just to sort of name some of the, the sort of specific points um, that, that uh, resonated for me there, um, you know, one is that, you know, there are many sort of organizations. I'm, you know, was the executive director of one, um, Career Speak Economic Justice and others that are, uh, you know, sort of not black specific organizations, but either have largely black uh, constituents and bases or, you know, um, you know, kind of leadership, you know, are black folks or what have you. Um, but I also agree with even having, you know, worked at Career Speak Economic Justice and you know, and still um, a, a member of the organization. Um, also have questions about like how um, are these multiracial formations um, actually uh, shifting in, in, in radical ways, either doing kind of mass mobilizing, um, you know, black people um, in, in those specific communities or really being able to kind of shift um, the paradigms um, you know, that exist in our society, right? And I would, I would argue that they, similar to Robin, that they haven't, right? And I think that that's a, a question that I really think that we need to, to grapple with, especially in um, a current culture that sort of talks about itself as post-race, and even from a left that really sort of um, jumps to uh, conclusions about sort of coalition building without raising these critical questions about um, you know, race and its function in um, uh, organizing and left politics. Um, so, so I would say as well, um, you know, uh, you know, it's another sort of point that gets raised is that, you know, some 
some folks in the black community may feel like organizing and black activists may feel like kind of organizing in black specific politics um, is, you know, sort of passe or, or of a specific era that no longer uh, has relevancy. Um, and, then, and then lastly, the point about, you know, uh, neoliberalism really um, being something that we have to really kind of contend with, um, both as it tries to, to, to articulate this, this, this sort of um, post-race analysis, but then also um, structurally undermines um, black communities in very particular ways, right, through privatization and other sort of methods. Um, now, some of the um, things that I, I guess that I'm thinking about um, in terms of a, a vision of, of new politics or ways to maybe think about um, politics differently. Um, one, I think, for me is just to, to think about the centrality of, of race um, and particularly the centrality of anti-black racism. Um, and I really consider race as the thing that organizes all other categories that we identify ourselves, right? What kind of man or what kind of woman, right, is constructed through race, right? And, um, and so while we talk about sort of intersectionality, which is like the new buzzword, um, are we in fact um, dismantling a, 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 a political analysis that understands what I think is the centrality of race and how it organizes everything else, right? And doesn't and doesn't distract from obviously homophobia, sexism, uh, you know, um, uh, economic oppression of poor people, so on and so forth. But that those things are organized um, and understood through through racial racial uh, identities. Um, secondly, is even as we think about um, you know kind of coalitions and multiracial formations and, and organizing on the left, how much of these things and also anti-black racism, I would argue, through these things are also driven through um, nonprofits and the, the kind of um, and philanthropy, right, and the the, the directives. Um, you know, from foundations often, or the the the, the kind of sometimes unspoken. Um, arguments about funding that I think push certain kinds of, you know, broad people of color or, or these sort of broad categories um, and, and I think push folks into those, uh, those categories and actually, you know, often resist funding black specific uh, mm -hmm. kinds of political organizing. And while we don't want to make the assumption that we need to rely on nonprofits and philanthropy as the sole way to do political activism and radical organizing, but, but that is the, the kind of context through which people mostly enter. Um, politi you know, people who think of themselves as political and wanting to do work, mm -hmm. it's where I get my paychecks, mm -hmm. quite frankly, right? So, I'm, you know, I'm just being straight up about mm -hmm. that. But, um, but, but I've also, you know, seen in, in a lot of um, foundations that the, these sort of tendencies. Um, and I would say um, my, the other question, you know, or just sort of point that I'm, I'm thinking about specific to, to, to black politics, and I think Kathy was raising some of these things, is how do we also organize of, um, black politics and black political formations that really and truly take, you know, queer people, LGBT people, however we identify seriously, that takes feminism seriously, that takes um, the experiences and organizes um, people who are homeless, who are largely black in this country, people who have HIV and AIDS who are largely black in this society, people who are prisoners who are largely black in this society. How do we um, organize in ways that actually um, don't just give lip service to different sort of marginal categories, but actually become dynamic places um, where we work um, through these different um, sort of categories. Um, and, I, and I would say, you know, one of the, the, the major sort of tensions there, and I feel like the holdovers, and I, I imagine will be debated if, if it hasn't been in some spaces in this conference, I mean, I think are just some of the, especially just as a, as a black gay man, some of the tendencies in um, kind of black so-called radical politics, right, that I think really um, are, are quite, um, conservative in their like you know gender and sexuality politics and not just around queer folks but just in general but certainly a very specific sort of tendency um, that 
that thinks about sort of um, radical black politics and black progress as predicated on um, nuclear family structures, right? And to me, that actually suggests that actually black queer people have to die in order for black progress to happen. And, and, and that is a, um, a very scary and dangerous, but, but has a 40-year, 50-year trajectory that um, many of our kind of political formations that consider themselves radical are still operating under those assumptions. Um, and the, the last thing I'll say um, before I close um, is also, I, I think this question, and I, I saw it in some of the kind of Occupy Wall Street stuff, I, which I wrote about, and, and, um, and see it even in uh, certain kinds of, um, you know, black politics where we have a tendency to want to, in our, I think, in our attempts to, to really express our humanity and the fact that we are, in fact, sentient beings, right, and not animals, um, this, what we end up doing, I think, sometimes then is, is expressing notions of innocence, right, that come up in a lot of, um, you know, kind of political work around prisoners, um, you know, was raised in the Trayvon, you know, Martin, uh, I think in some specific ways, raised um, certainly in the execution of Troy Davis. And while I think that, you know, whether people are innocent of the specific sort of crimes that they are being um, uh, identified as having committed, but just, I think, operating, understanding in the world that, like, to be black and innocent is an oxymoron, right? And that's it. So, <laughs> so let's not try to rely on those kinds of assumptions in order to frame, um, in, in order to try to kind of argue ourselves into a human category. Um, and so, and so then, it, it, to me, it requires a different set of assumptions and what we, what are we willing to embrace, right? Are we willing to embrace criminality? Are we willing to embrace um, abandonment? Are we willing to em embrace these things um, as, as actual possible political places from which, from, through which to struggle um, and not categories through which to run from because as black folks we are marked with them, period, right? And what, and, and what kinds of um, political uh, possibilities lie um, there versus um, you know, and is, I think it's the, the way in which a lot of our sort of, you know, politics of respectability are often, I think, people running from being seen as that kind of N-word, right? Mm -hmm. Like, even within, you know, black politics, right? And so how do we remove that and really embrace, um, you know, that sense of, um, to, to embrace those kinds of racial ontologies, I, I guess is the best way to put it. Um, and I will close with, with those sets of questions more than I have answers to, actually. <laughs> Thank you. I'm going to stand up. How's everybody? Uh, that don't sound too good. <laughs> don't sound too good. So, I've been thinking a lot since Robin asked me to do this uh, about a year ago when they first started coming up with the idea, off and on through the work, um, and most recently in the last two weeks, <laughs> um, about this question of vision and a new vision, and this question of um, freedom, and this, this question of voice, and the question of being, and the question of dignity and respect, and how those things work together. And the, and the question for me, um, and I think that's been raised thus far as well of, of the, the question of, of, of trauma and, and, and psyche and ho being holistic and being whole and what's it mean when you're in the moment all the time and trying to figure all this out and who can you talk to and who can you trust and we all on camera and all of those kinds of questions. Um, and how does that operate through the person that is Rhonda? And how does it operate through the person that's in the academy? And how does that operate through the person who, you know, uh, uh, is trying to create spaces for other people to have their voices heard? And how does that operate through actually trying to work through the academy with community to try to do something at the grassroots that can make a difference? I want to start off with three quotes. And then I want to try to share a few of the things that, that we're trying to do. Um, through the Social Justice Institute, or some of the ideas that at least are, are attempting to drive the Social Justice Institute at Case Western Reserve University. And 
actually, the quotes are going to go backwards. So my first quote is from 2012. It was a conference I just went to, and then, then I'm going to jump to 2011, and I'm going to go to 1976, and I'm going to come back to 1996, and then we're going to be back in 2012 with the Institute. 2012! And I was just at a conference talking about democracy, American democracy, and Barack Obama, and I started off my, my paper this way. I said, and what if I am an angry black woman? You know, what if I am an angry black woman who is tired of people telling me I shouldn't be angry when the society is a bastion of inequality and the rainbow over the White House is projected by the willful ignorance of people telling me to find Alice's rabbit hole? Warning, this is a sequel and lessons in becoming a saboteur and the cogitations of a willful provocateur of an unapologetic, angry black woman. Enraged by the state of affairs that continue to delimit the chances and the opportunities and demonize and marginalize citizens of different hues. I am a hue woman. 2011 James Baldwin, 1976 Centennial, a challenge to bicentennial candidates. James Baldwin's in this, James Baldwin discusses in this essay the special, what he calls the special interests which rule the American cities, 1976, bicentennial. And social disaster and unhappy priorities dictated by responsibility, the responsibility, the responsibility of protecting the free world, quote unquote, the free world. And the candidate trying to figure out, quote, what unhappy market he can dump our excess Coca-Cola in. And then Baldwin challenges the candidate to, quote, walk, not ride, through the black streets of Washington, D.C., and wides in Detroit, and Chicago, and San Francisco, and Boston, and Philadelphia, and Pittsburgh, and Baltimore, and yes, Atlanta, and Cleveland, and Gary, and Jackson, and New York. I challenge the candidate, James Baldwin says, to visit Harlem Hospital. I challenge him, and I'm going to add her, to visit the prisons of the country. I challenge the candidate to love the country he claims, she claims to love the entire extent of love and to face it, this present chaos, face it, this present chaos, and help the country to face itself and for the sake of all our children to change it. Manny Marable wrote in 1996, 20 years from then, freedom, vision, voice, being, human dignity, psychic pain, trauma, what do I do, how do I move through the world? Manny Marable wrote in 1996, we black progressives had failed in part because we had not articulated an effective alternative political vision capturing the mind and the mood of our people, recognizing the basic transformations in the political economy and social structure which had occurred inside black America since the civil rights movement. We were still using old slogans and primitive theoretical tools to analyze a complex political culture dominated by high technology, cyberspace, and the information revolution. We had to find within ourselves the courage, the courage, the courage, the courage to seek a politics which truly reinforced and reinvigorated ethical democratic values. A political language, that democratic language must be constructed, that strategy must be appropriate to the actual processes of the U.S. political system with demands which go beyond reform and empower the oppressed to seek even greater social changes. And then I recall Ella Baker and her radical humanocratic vision. And how does that help me think about freedom and vision and a new vision and freedom and being and feeling and psychic pain and trauma and trying to move and trying to keep it moving? And I've tried to do this in various ways by pulling people around me and working with people who are, have their hands on the pulse, their hands on the pulse, not just their fingers on the pulse, but their hands on the pulse of what's going on in community. How can I, from the space in which I operate, translate, move from, move between, understand sincerely and honestly with theory as a weapon and history as a weapon to really try to transform and change in the best way I can working alongside people who are at the grassroots. 
One of the ways that I try to do this, and some of us um, at Case Western Reserve try to do this, and there's always complexities and challenges and barriers and different constellations, and I won't get into all of that, but some of the ways some of us try to do this through that work um, is uh, through the establishment of a social justice institute at Case Western Reserve University. And I have to say, and Tim is gonna have to tell me when I'm five minutes out, because people who know me know I can go. So if, I, if you can give me five minutes, and just, just shut me down. When, um, when I tell people there's a social justice institute at Case Western Reserve University, and many of you might not have ever heard of Case Western Reserve University. We're in Cleveland. We're mostly known for our science, medicine, engineering, and technology. And um, when I tell people there's such a thing, they go, huh? What do you mean, Cleveland State? What do you mean, Oberlin? What do you mean, John Carroll? Is, well, Oberlin's 40 minutes away, 45 minutes away. John Carroll's a Catholic you know, uh, constellation in terms of its uh, grounding and in institutional culture. And I say, no, at Case Western Reserve University, we have this thing called Social Justice Institute. And one of the things that we're trying to do is really work under three umbrellas. And people are excited, but they're also wondering what's going on, and they're also wondering like how true it is, and they're also wondering how long it's gonna last. And these actually are questions I have as well and the administration knows I have, I have these questions and we talk about them. But we work under three constellations. Those three constellations are programs, programs and events, actually establishing projects and initiatives in community, and curriculum uh, on campus that seeks to try to transform and open up dialogues that may not have existed on campus before. And all of this revolves around a kind of vision of what it means to have something organized around social justice as opposed to not in replacement of a women and gender studies or sexuality studies or black studies or a something studies. How can we begin to bring the wheels of the spoke together to really talk about what this means under a constellation of something called social justice, where we talk about the interlocking oppressions um, and we're also trying to figure out how we create kind of coalitions and dynamics of really uh, supporting and understanding and arguing and being in tension moments, but then can try to figure out how we move, 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 move through these things together, right? So what kind of new frameworks might we have to develop to pull together all of the various spaces that we operate within? And so social justice is one of the ways that we try to create this space, this vision. What issues expressed should we be talking about? Whose voices should we be listening to? Whose voices are at the table? Who is in the room? Who is on the streets? Who is at the podium? These are all questions that are driving some of the work that we're doing, and, and particularly drive me to do the work as I do it. And how do we connect and hear and contextualize these voices through a discourse and a mission and a vision that will help us march toward transformation? In other words, that it just doesn't become about the coalitions and the wheels, the spokes of the wheel coming together in the center, right? And we can say like, we're at the center working together, but that we really are dealing with the content and that we really are establishing and thinking about a process. And we really are taking up words and trying to educate those who, including ourselves, might not really be engaged in a kind of um, deep, uh, a deep visioning or a deep kind of um, uh, 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 understanding and, and a debunking of the ways that we understand the world and political economy. I just came from a session. I'm going off. I'm going off. I'm 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 going to go over y'all, but and he's going to shut me down. But I just came from a session with parents and educators and organizers. And I don't know if any of them are in the room because I really can't see across here. And there were some young people there. And they, they were talking about um, Walter, Ro uh, uh, Walter Rodney and, and the, the link to Marilyn Marable's uh, question of the underdevelopment of the United States of America. And talking about questions of gentrification. Now I'm coming from a campus where there are some people talking about that, but they're not grappling with those issues. What, what do you mean? Right? They're not, the people in communities sometimes aren't even grappling with questions of neoliberalism and what that means. So when they're looking at public education, and Cleveland is one of those places that's getting ready to go down the road of a transformation plan that I'm trying to look more into to understand the privatization of neoliberal market politics that are saying public education is not working as it is, so just get rid of it and, and start all these different schools without investing in public education. So when I raise the question of neoliberal politics and ideology, I get the, what? 
The question of gentrification and what that means, can gentrification ever be something that's nice? I've had conversations with politicians that say, do you understand when you use the term gentrification, it's not just about rehab and rebuilding, you know, bringing in uh, the, the stability and the, 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 the foundations and the, and, and the economic uh, equality moments to sustain your community. This vision that you have of what it means for a community to thrive and for people in it to be free, do you understand that gentrification also speaks of displacement? Right? And who gets the benefit from what that means? Even if it unpacks the fact that there are issues that we need to deal with. Content. So we're trying to deal with some of those issues through content, through theory, through understanding theory, and through actually developing processes and tools and ways to engage in activism and advocacy with people in community as we learn from each other. I just want to mention two things, um, two examples, and then maybe close out with a, with, a, with a quote if I have time. One is when we first inaugurated the Social Justice Institute at Case Western Reserve University, we held an opening intergenerational conference. And that conference was called Race, Social Justice, and Profiling an intergenerational think tank. And what we did was, I want to talk a little bit about the content because for me it speaks to the various elements that, that Kenyon and Kathy have already talked about, and I know Loretta's going to take us right deep into the work on the ground. And that is we started off that first Friday, it was a two-day conference, that Friday evening, we talked about history and the legacies of, legacies of history, repercussions, the repercussions. And we brought in Don Freeman. Um, who actually helped establish the Revolutionary Action Movement, who was fired from his job because he taught African American history and that was considered radical uh, in the Cleveland schools. And we brought in Ms. Anona Clayton, who worked with the C uh, SCLC. And we had them talk about their experiences, but then we had them talk about what it means in terms of today's repercussions and legacies. What are the issues that they think we still need to grapple with? And a lot of us do that in the room, right? But to move that then into a new day on Saturday that focused on not necessarily narrowly, and I'm saying narrowly in quotation marks, the questions of civil rights and the kind of black freedom struggle as we understand it and think about it and historicize it, but then to think about how those issues relate under a different constellation of concerns. So we talked about immigration, and we talked about criminal injustice. And we talked about redlining and housing foreclosure. So what does it mean to connect the history and the legacies and the repercussions to these other things that people see often as disparate already, but connected in and of themselves, linked back to a theme that's called race, race, social justice, and profiling? What do these things have to do with profiling? We really wanted to begin to push people to think about the intersections, the overlaps, the disjunctures, the disruptions, and the ways in which different communities have been organizing on their own for good reason, for valid reasons, whether they're contentious reasons or whether because they're finding opportunities and engaged in a local grassroots moment, but how those things are very much connected. And if we are to think about root causes and dismantling and creating a new vision of freedom that really gets to the root causes as we deal with the short-term repercussions, then we have to begin to think about how all of these disparate components of the picture connect to each other. We had young people there from ages 10, 12, 15, all the way up to elders of 70 plus. So the other question is, how can we create a vision of freedom where whose voices at the table is always the question? And who are we listening to? And who are we hearing? And what kind of visions of freedom are we trying to co-create together? I think that's really important. And then we ended the conference with an evening of art in conversation. So we had Dr. Bernice Johnson Regan talking to Bakari Kitwana and only opened the floor to young people to ask questions so that we could constantly get this intergenerational dialogue going and have youth express their concerns and be in a dialogue with different multiple generations. That's one example. I think education is really important how we tie it together. And there's some people who say, talk, 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 talk. That's like, you know, overrated talk, right? And I always say to people, it depends on what the talk contains. Because some of us are doing a lot of talking and not saying anything. And the kind of talk we need to have, we're not having, either because we are not having this multiple dialogue or we're afraid to raise the issues wherever we find ourselves. 
The other example I wanted to give just actually happened. Um, it was our inaugural Power Up Social Justice Student Leadership Conference at Case Western Reserve University. And we opened it up to high school students and college students and asked them to come together to talk about how we really begin to identify issues and move them to a plan for action. So while this conference was also about identifying the critical social justice issues, it was also about trying in our minimal way in this first phase to impart a process. How do we get all of you in a room who have different views and visions and ideas and passions that are driving you around social justice or whatever your issue is to come out of that room in an hour and 15 minutes with one issue that you've identified as the critical social justice issue and for, for this conference, for youth? How do you identify, build consensus, narrow it down, figure it out? How do you distinguish between an issue and a problem? I mean, some of these, what we might call you know, very kind of nitty gritty things, I think we don't spend enough time on when we're thinking about how do we build, how do we sustain, how do we organize, how do we move, how do we move, how do we move, how do we move and engage and talk. And so they had to identify issues. What they did was they identified an issue in that first session. Then they went to a lunch plenary and we had a whole session on thinking campaigns. What can you do? What are the strategies? What are the tactics? What are the tools today? from yesterday that we still can use today. How do you frame it? And they went back into their same breakout sessions and they used those campaign frameworks and ideas around it to apply to their issue and develop a plan for action for how to move forward on that particular issue. And then we had report outs and they came back and they were, now this was a long day. We started at 8.30 in the morning, it went to seven o'clock at night. They came back to the report out session so geared up and jazzed up powered up, powered up, fired up, just to share the process and trying to figure out where can we go from here. They came up with questions of bullying, they came up with questions of returning citizens and re-entry, young people. Of course, education and getting a quality education and what that means. Some of them talked about how can we get student voices on the school board? Not just speaking at the school board, but represented on the school board. Some of them talked about frameworks like mental segregation. I mean, just powerful, powerful frameworks that they were coming up with. And so the other thing is, how often do we listen to the youth? And what I told them is, and everybody in the room knows it, that most of the social movements we are engaged in or have been engaged in have been propelled by young people. I still consider myself in that category. <laughs> so I'm still gonna be powered up and fired up with them, right? So how can we explain, expand, support, step back, propel, allow themselves to see how they have the power to make a difference and that their voice makes a difference? The voicing, the talking, the being, the freedom, the dignity, the respect, how do you move, how do you keep it moving, how do you vision, all of that together. How do you create an effective political democracy? How do you create an effective political democracy that deals with material reality, that deals with discourses, that deals with economic inequality, that deals with the emotional sustenance that all of us need to continue the work that we must do, that we have to do, unless we are foregoing our responsibility and our obligations. So I wanna, I wanna end with Emil Carl Cabral, actually. And then just a couple questions. In 1966, in Weapons of Theory, he wrote that we also know that on the political level of our own reality, however fine and attractive the reality of others may be, that we can only be transformed by detailed knowledge of it that is our own reality, by our own efforts, and by our own sacrifices. And I would add, by listening to the multiple voices and understanding how to translate them through process into action. So my questions are these. How does a new vision of freedom in terms of the work we do as academicians and scholar activists and activist scholars and those who actually will remove the scholar from our activists and say we are also activists on the ground, work in, with, on behalf of, and for community? 
how do we begin to think about an ideology of change that is endowed with purpose and philosophy and historical legacy and nuance and complexity that deals both with the short term but also the long term? How do we not get stuck in the short term and forget the long term? What is the form? What does it mean to establish or attempt to establish a creative intellectual research advocacy space, a position under an umbrella for me that has heretofore been safer in community to establish versus in the academy to enact and be welcomed, quote unquote, welcome. I mean, not only in the academy, but welcome in community because I'm in the academy or welcome in the academy because of the, how I'm seen allying with the community to do the work that contests the corporatization of not only the academy, but the neoliberal market privatization driven dynamics that really undercut our ability to access dignity and respect and human rights and economic justice and inequality and the material realities that we face. Sonia Sanchez says, and I will end here, who are we as a nation, as a people? Who are we? And I say, whose voices are at the table? Thank you. Let's see, does this mic work? How y'all doing? I'm a southerner from Georgia, so we have a different way of talking. Uh, I could not talk at a New York speed if you had a <laughs> gun to my head. <laughs> because our first 10 minutes are usually spent just trying to know who you are, who your family is, and whether you're worth conversing with anymore. <laughs> um, my name's Loretta Ross, and I'm here at the invitation of Robin Spencer, who I had the joy of meeting while we both were in South Africa. And I did not know that this darling young woman that I was meeting was the goddaughter of one of my good friends, Sophia Bandelli, uh, from Medgar Evers, who just retired. But it does turn out that the revolutionary world is actually quite small. <laughs> and if you keep doing the good work, you meet all the good people over and over and over again which kind of limits your ability to successfully uh, do a revisionist thing on your resume. <laughs> because you'll meet too many people who knew you when. And that's a little bit about my speech today, because I've been a street activist much more than a person in the academy. I actually didn't graduate from college until I was 55 years old, so I can't say that I'm an academy girl. I went through it trying to protest a couple of times. <laughs> um, the name of my speech is The Way We Never Were, A New Vision of Freedom. And the theory that I'm going to offer is that as one who was there in the 60s and 70s and 80s, I believe that black nationalist feminism transform black politics, including Manning Marables. And that's what I'm going to talk about today. And I came into the movement as a young black feminist, even though I actually didn't use the F word in applying it to myself, because when you're in the black nationalist movement, you tended to associate feminism with white women. But as a survivor of incest and rape, I knew I was pissed off about what had happened to me. And I found many, many like-minded women within the nationalist movement, namely people like Sophia Bandelli and Nikenji Toure, who'd been in the Black Panther Party, Jamala Rogers, who was now with the BRC, but was working with black youth at the time. And we formed then what we call the Women's Committees of the National Black United Front and the National Black Independent Political Party. And it was in MBIP that I actually first met Manning Marable. And my first conversation with the brother was convincing, trying to convince him of the necessity for there to be a Women's Committee. Because the common thinking of the brothers at the time 
is that the more attention we call, we brought to these issues of gender, the more we detracted from the real black struggle. And I remember being on many stages like this, literally getting booed at by the black nationalist brothers who um, just couldn't understand why we would claim that a divided people cannot wage revolutionary struggle. And we were divided based on violence, based on gender oppression, based on a whole lot of other stuff. But I have to say for Brother Manning, after we had that struggle with him, he was probably the most flexible and pragmatic and less dogmatic of all the brothers that we had those conversations with back then. Because a few years later, when he wrote his book, How Capitalism Underdeveloped Black America, brother had all that stuff in there about sexism and all that stuff. And I was like, yeah, <laughs> we got <gotcha."> you. <laughs> You know, and, and, and so I couldn't help but wink, wink at him every time I saw him after that, because, of course, I'm going to remind him about 1981. <laughs> because a lot of brothers just didn't get it at the outset. And they barely, a lot of brothers get it now, but there's still brothers that have the same speeches in 1970 that they have in 2012. So those I've kind of given up on. <laughs> I mean, it's kind of why many of us no longer call ourselves associated with the black nationalist movement, because we're ready for new thinking and new paradigms. And we're tired of people trying to show off how much knowledge they've gotten in these obscure texts when they pretend to ask a question when they really just want to show off. <laughs> but moving right along. <laughs> Why would I say such an outrageous thing that black nationalist feminists transform black politics? Well, first of all, I think that the black nationalist movement that was in my win and where I entered story was riveted over the question of whether race or class was the dominant thing to talk about. I mean, there were people trying to say that they were more Marxist or more socialist than the other person, and the other person kept saying, well, the Marxists don't really take in questions of race enough, so, you know. I mean, it was a testosterone battle like you've never, ever seen. And in reality, even though they purported to speak for the masses, they weren't necessarily listening to the masses because the masses would have been totally bored by any of that kind of discussion, particularly with the endless hours with which we conducted it. And so for us entering along the vector of gender, who said, I managed to be both a woman and race conscious and class conscious all at the same time. There's no space for me to really have this kind of conversation with you. And so I would argue that the black feminist analysis from the nationalist movement bought into the conversation that often debated term called intersectionality now. Long before Kim Crenshaw named it, Sojourner Truth proclaimed it when she said, ain't I a woman? So for those of you who are just now discovering intersectionality, welcome to the party. <laughs> because it's been around for a long, long time at the hands of black women. You know? <laughs> but another impact and I don't just want to talk about Kimberly Crenshaw because I saw, and I'm so glad you're here, Angela. Angela Davis is here because when I read your race and gender analysis of reproductive politics, I mean, it was like I had to write black abortion because of you. So, you know, you were on it long before. 
before everybody else was on it. Everybody remembered you from George Jackson, but they didn't remember you from the incisive analysis that you made around gender politics in the 80s when we really needed that. So thank you, sister. I want to name that. I want to name Audre Lorde, who had conversations with James Baldwin back in the 1970s and 80s about gender and sexuality and sexual orientation that was totally ignored by the black nationalist movement of which I was a part. I remember a, a black writers conference at Howard University, I think it was like in 1983, and Audrey was afraid to come out at the conference. Only Barbara Smith stood up and came out at the conference because of the venom that was being exhibited against black queer folks by our so-called black nationalist movement at the time. And so, you know, Unfortunately, when you've been around long enough, you remember all this stuff, and all that you remember ain't necessarily pretty, but because I can remember it, it also can't be revised out of our memory. But we do need to write more about this stuff. Um, the other thing that I think black feminists uh, have brought to the movement is to really offer a critique of this narrow, charismatic, nationalist leader model that's so easily assassinated, killing our movements. If you look at the women's movement, and I don't care which sector you look at it, whether it's the white women's movement, the black women's movement, the queer women's movement, all of those movements, we're movement. We are a movement. And the reason we're a movement is because when many people think different ideas, but they move in the same direction, that's a movement. But when people think one idea and they move in the same direction, that's a cult. Mm. And we've built a women's movement, not a women's cult. And we've avoided that charismatic one leader model that can so easily be assassinated by the state. We have transformed societies worldwide without having one single woman you can point to and say, this is the reason we have a women's movement. I think it was Ella Baker who, first, who I first read about, who offered a theoretical construct for this thing that I'm describing as the women's movement now. And I'm proud to be part of it. And now we want to offer that to, our black, to, to, to the black community. Why are we keep looking for the new messiah? And trust me, it's not Barack Obama. You know, even though I'm gonna talk about him in a little bit. <laughs> Another thing that we've offered to the black nationalist movement is some, uh, the black politics. I consider critical reproductive theory. And that is where you take critical race theory and apply it to reproductive politics. And we, as black women, coined in 1994 the concept of reproductive justice so successfully that it has taken over and eclipsed the whole pro-choice paradigm that the white women use. And that's been at the leadership of black women. And now when you talk about reproductive politics, people are no longer talking about it without intersecting race, class, immigration status, religious status, and all of that within these conversations. And that's been at the leadership of black women. Um, other things I want to talk about, maybe I should switch to the other part of my speech, though, is two other things, and that is something, what you call radical empathy? Mm -hmm. We would call self-help mm -hmm. in our movement, but mainly just understanding that the personal is political. I find it interesting that we have whole audiences unable to hear the personal story of Malcolm while they deify the political story of Malcolm. But Malcolm or anybody else, not even Manning Marable, is anything other than a human being with contradictions. And so within our self-help model, we understand that these contradictions can either liberate you or hold you back. And it's how you process and work through those contradictions that decide which side of history you're on. And the more you try to hide your contradictions, the more you're gonna sabotage the struggle that you claim to be a part of. And this is something that we understand in the women's movement. And finally, on the, um, what we brought to the movement speech, I wanna talk about 
ending violence against women, because the first Rape Crisis Center was founded in this country in 1972. I had the joy of being its third executive director. I was not the first. There were two black women ahead of me. But what is little known is that black women founded the movement to end violence against women in this country, along with white women. But we were, it was four black women who ran the very first Rape Crisis Center in this country. And we also led conversations about how do you engage with the state when it comes to dealing with crime in our communities? Because we always problematized the prison industrial complex and whether or not it was righteous to turn brothers over to the state when we're trying to end the violence in our homes and in our communities. And so this also is not a new conversation that just began with the new Jim Crow. It's a conversation that began 40 years ago in the women's community about the whole role of the prison industrial complex and its role in policing and monitoring and suppressing our community while it's being offered as a solution to the crime that is often male-centered crime in our communities. So enough on that. Let's talk about a vision for the future because that's enough history. Um, I brought with me from my work with a coalition called the Trust Black Women Partnership a free video and a free newsletter that's out on the table because the thing that we've been fighting most recently are billboards being placed around the country claiming that abortion is black genocide and somehow that black women are the new Nazis wiping out the black race. And I have to say, this truly pissed us off because it's mainly white people putting up these billboards, maligning and attacking the dignity of African-American women, which really wouldn't surprise me and really wouldn't even piss me off that bad because white people are white people. But, I mean, they've always been dissing black people. That's not original or new and we're kind of used to that. But the number of brothers who buy into that BS really pissed me off. I've had more debates with brothers that somehow believe that black women are killing the black race when historically it's been black women saving the black race, which is why we're here to even have this conversation. So I'm not going to go into a diatribe about abortion and reproductive rights and stuff, even though that's my favorite topic. I'm just going to leave it at that because I want to move towards the new vision that I have in my mind. First of all, we are in a war of position and language. And I believe that it ain't enough for us to talk about what we're against. We need to talk about what we're for. If we won, what kind of world would we build? I hear very little conversation over my last 40 years about that topic. Everybody can articulate to the nth degree what they hate. And they perfected the politics of hatred and division in the process. So I'm going to be stunningly unoriginal and quote Brother Malcolm and quote Brother King and quote of many other people who came before me, DuBose and other ones, and say we need to build a world based on human rights. We don't have to reinvent the wheel. We just need to listen sometime to the people who are much smarter than us and figure this out and not be so arrogant that we think that we can come up with a better answer than the people who we like to cite and quote. That's an example of American exceptionalism besetting the left. We always talk about it on the right, but we always think that we can figure out something better than human rights if you just give us enough time and enough microphones. So in closing, I want to say, um, regardless of how much work I work on gender politics, which is my passion, I also work in an intersectional way. You heard my resume. May I was a black woman who spent a decade going to Klan rallies. I am dedicated to fighting white supremacy as strongly as I am around fighting uh, sexism and the patriarchy and all of this. And so what concerns me now 
is the lack of conversation in the African American and black communities on the racism and the resurgence of the Tea Party and the white supremacist movement. You know, 40% of voters in November 10 said they were Tea Party members. Now, 40% of white people have said they were in the Klan, we might have paid attention. But I think we forget that there is a direct relationship between the Ku Klux Klan and the Tea Party. Even though I'm not accusing everybody in the Tea Party of knowing that they are racist. At least the Klan knew they were racist. You know, but we got white people who are uh, totally unaware that they're being racist nowadays because they actually think that they have, because they have one or two black people they like, that they can't possibly be racist. And I think they get confused and alarmed by the election of Barack Obama because they're as confused about him as many black people are. I was actually in a debate with Elaine Brown once. Um, from the uh, Black Panther Party. And a questioner asked her whether or not they should vote in the 08 election, this young student at Morehouse. And she responded, and I hope I'm not telling anything because she got mad at me. She said, no, because you know, we, this election doesn't mean anything. You know? And she went on into her diatribe. And I had to publicly disagree with her, which of course made her a permanent unlike on my Facebook page, I'm sure she doesn't like me anymore, because, <laughs> you know, I had to say, if you can't tell the difference between voting for a neo-fascist, which is the choice we had, and a neoliberal, you really are missing the important story of 2008. Now, I'm no fan of neoliberal politics, but at least with the neoliberal, you'll be around to debate the politics. <laughs> with the neo-fascist, your ass ain't going to be here long. <laughs> and if you can't tell the difference between those two states, I don't know what to tell you. Yeah, that's so true. That's true. I mean, there is something worse than neoliberalism. It's called fascism, and it is quickly approaching in America. So let's not lose sight of how the Tea Party has morphed from a protest movement to a social movement that has transformed the political system under our eyes into a more openly white supremacist system without actually using the word white supremacy. And we're almost asleep at the wheel, not even noticing. And we think that it's just uh, uh, an accident that they're talking about getting rid of all of these illegal immigrants and rolling back the tax on women's rights, rolling back abortion rights and attacking gay rights and labor rights. These folks are out to repeal the entire 20th century. And you know how important the 20th century was to us? <laughs> I mean, this is crazy. <laughs> that we're not paying attention. And so I really want to try to close for real and talk about... <laughs> you got to get other books in. <laughs> well, I've got a lot I wrote, so I'm trying not to go too much over. You know, understand the relationship between the Tea Party and the John Birch Society and the Council of Conservative Citizens, which is the legacy of the white citizens' councils from the, you know, anti-desegregation movement. There's a lot we can learn. And even though this is not the audience that would probably pay a lot of attention to the NAACP, they actually issued an excellent report on deconstructing the G Party with Leonard Zeskin and the Institute for Human Rights and Education, which I really, really recommend you to get. I've forgotten the name of the report right now. But the next thing that they have their targets on as an organized white supremacist movement. And by the way, I want to say white supremacy is a body of ideas. It is not a racial designation because everybody who believes in white supremacy is no longer white. Think of Alan West, for example. You know, the guy in Florida who thought that, you know, 80 people in Congress are communists. We should be so damn lucky. <laughs> you know? God, I wish he was right. <laughs> you know, but anyway, 
they've got their eye now on repealing the 17th Amendment. We know about the 14th, the 13th, and 14th Amendment, ending the, 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 the indices and badges of slavery and all of that. But the Citizenship Rights Amendment is something that I've just learned about myself. I'm not even sure if I'm quoting it right, because I just read about it a couple of months ago. But trying to end birthright citizenship, claiming that they're doing it for illegal aliens, to use their word. But do you imagine that they will not stretch to then remove citizenship rights from those of us that they don't think are good, upright citizens? So we could find ourselves asleep at the wheel and not being thrown back to Reconstruction, but being thrown back to redemption. When the backlash against Reconstruction happened, when we lose voting rights, because we see the attacks on voting rights that's taking place in the states and all of that, the attack on women's rights, labor rights, on and on, the environment. I mean, I get tired thinking about how many fronts they're fighting on, and I get disappointed in thinking about how little we understand the necessity to work across race, to work across gender, to work across all of these barriers, silos that we've put up in order to properly protect ourselves and advance a new vision for freedom. Thank you. Thank you very much. Okay, we have about a little under a half an hour for a conversation now. And what we're going to do is we're going to ask folks to line up at the mics, and we're going to take three or four questions, maybe two from each side, and then we'll have the panelists, uh, 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 panelists answer questions as they see fit. If you have a specific question for a specific panelist, please make sure that you uh, say that, and please try to keep, in the interest of having as many voices as part of this part of the session as possible, please try to keep your comment and question as succinct as possible. Yes. Thank you. We'll start here. In fact, uh, oh, Tim, oh, with your oh, permission, sorry. we're going to ask that uh, two things that you stick to 45 seconds or less, and we're also going to ask that you disguise your comment in the form of a question. Of a question. <laughs> <laughs> right, those two things. M Manning used to often say, if, yes. if, if, you, if we would have asked you to be on the panel, if we wanted you to give a 15-minute comment. <laughs> Go ahead, sir. Yeah, I'm going to be really concise, but my question is directed. First of all, it was a great panel. I enjoyed it very much. Uh, my question is directed to Sister Ross. Uh, I formerly uh, developed a chapter of MBIP uh, in Albany years ago, so right on, Sister. Um, you know, every election cycle, the Democratic and Republican parties continue to move to the right. I mean, we're still left with the lesser of the two evils, and of course the Republican Party is as crazy as you've just mentioned it. What would be a new vision of politics that will build capacity, that that, those, that kind of choice is no longer with us, and that we can begin to use electoral politics in a way that's really self-empowering and not disempowering? Thank you. Okay, thank you. And over here. Hi, thank you very much, um, specifically to Ms. Ross, who is a, a hero of mine as of today. Um, so my question is, um, what, how are we supposed to realize the end of um, white supremacy when even talking about something like that is considered um, faux pas or that there is no white supremacy? So if I can't even have a conversation with people about it, how are we supposed to end it? Because I feel like we need to get everybody on board for this to happen, but that's going to take the next hundred years to do. So what are, what, what are some options for that? Okay. And we'll take these two. Well. Uh, I'm well, thinking now. about radical empathy. Um, Richard Wright said after in How Bigger Was Born that he had been naive to write Uncle Tom children, Uncle Tom's children in a way that even bankers' daughters could weep over and that the next time he wrote a book it would be so hard and so deep that they would have to face it without the consolation of tears. And so I'm wondering how you have an empathy that isn't captured by liberal sentimentality. Um, how do you make it radical? Yeah. Um, how do you make it cutting as well as binding? Great. That's a great question. Thank you. And yes? Um, there's often um, like 
street level organizers usually point out the fact that more scholastic analytical organizers are so separate from the people who are actually affected by the issues that they're discussing. And so how do you bring together the people who are affected like to be able to understand and process and to integrate into their work the, pe the more scholastic, analytical, theoretical thought? Okay, great. Let's take those four questions and begin the conversation. Do you want to take the question about radical empathy? No. No, no you don't. Else okay. Would, no, okay. okay. Uh, radical. Christian, what's up? I happen to know him. So um, I, I think that's a great critique, and I'm not offering this as kind of some new theoretical category. I'm saying it's a way for me to kind of work through uh, trying to think about what would motivate me or what should motivate me on a consistent basis, right, to show up for other people. I think the idea of kind of capture is right, but if we can somehow uh, build into kind of a radical empathy, not only the idea of relating with, but giving to, so that in fact sacrifice and the uh, um, visibility of power shifting becomes part of that, then it's not just a kind of empathetic moment of I understand, but, but that understanding calls to a form of action. And I think that becomes a kind of radical component of this that builds a kind of collective understanding that's about mobilization and movement. So that would be the difference, I think, maybe. Great. Can I take the, um, the last question about um, sort of the academy and intellectualism and politics? Um, you know, I always tell people this, like, I, you know, I, people A, sometimes assume I have a PhD, which I don't. I think, um, you know, and I tell people, my, you know, I talk to my mother about anything we talk to in here. My mother has a, a high school diploma, right? Mm -hmm. and, and anybody in my family, some of whom don't have high school diplomas. And so I think that there is, um, I, I, I think, I think that while we definitely want to make sure that whatever kind of intellectual work we're doing from whatever location we're doing it, from the academy, from, you know, more grassroots work or whatever, or as journalists or whatever, um, that, you know, we're thinking about, you know, um, not just who's reading your stuff, but who are you speaking to, right? Um, which is a very different <laughs> uh, question sometimes. Um, and then two, that, um, and that we don't also, because I feel like even I hear amongst a lot of kind of grassroots activists a real kind of anti-intellectualism that I think is really dangerous. Mm -hmm. You know, I, when, when I was in college, I was in, in undergrad, you know, just, just the year before, um, you know, Mandela became president of South Africa, and I had lots of friends from South Africa at the university I went to all of whom had been reading Gramsci and a whole, where Angela Davis, I mean, people thought, you know, really, like really, and um, what people talked about, they were reading as like, you know, junior high, high school kids as part of, and they, these, were, these were South Africans from Soweto, right? These were not wealthy, um, you know, South Africans here to go to school. Um, and, so, and so to me, I think that um, this tendency to dismiss ideas as like academic, often is a way to dismiss, to not just deal with the politics of what people are talking about, right? And people say that to me, and I'm like, I don't have a PhD, boo, come again, right? Like, <laughs> so what, what's your real concern? Um, <laughs> name that. So, you know, so I, I so, so um, and I don't necessarily know a strategy to do that, but I don't assume, you know, I work now in an organization that works with homeless people with AIDS, and I don't assume that, like, folks who are clients in that organization can't have a conversation with me about whatever, right, and, or whoever I meet, and that's just um, an, an assumption, you know, that, that I, I, you know, I try to kind of roll with in the world. And just based on, like, the people that I've learned a range of things from, related to me as family members and, and not, you know, um, that hasn't shown up in, in ways that, um, you know, people would always assume in terms of like what was recommended to me as books, what ideas people are thinking about, so on and so forth. But I think we operate in a really dangerous context where people um, really sort of dismiss any kind of work that reads intellectual to them, whatever, however people define that, but it's really a way to dismiss the, the, the ideas and the, and the arguments, the politics. Mm -hmm. I mean, I would say on that last, on the last question that Kenyon was just talking about, 
um, figuring out ways to create the spaces where we're in constant dialogue. Um, and that's, that's one of the things that I'm trying to, I'm trying to figure out um, at CASE and just, you know, both through the Social Justice Institute, but just as Rhonda in Cleveland. Um, what are the spaces where I can go have dialogues with people at the grassroots? Not assuming that I'm going to take necessarily anything to them, but that I can also learn from and hear from them. And one of the, one of the um, theories undergirding a class I teach, which is called City is Classroom, is a class where we, I teach it for the first time on campus just so we can find each other. And after that, we're in community. Um, and the idea is that, you know, I mean, many of us, we, we articulate this, that, that knowledge is not just produced in the ivory tower. Knowledge is not just produced where we are. And, you know, I try to convey that to my students all the time, that you need to go and you need to listen and you need to hear. And just because you read this book or you had this quote or this statistic doesn't mean that you know more than folks on the ground who are living it and activating all the time around these particular issues. And that there's also this space for dialogue, for mutual learning, for reciprocal um, engagement as well. Um, and so th that's what I try to do. I try to find those spaces. There are a couple, um, you know, I do it through the class. I'm trying to do it through the institute, through these kinds of conferences that have legs beyond the actual conference itself. Um, trying to find spaces where what, youth really want to be engaged and trying to help them move forward with what they want to do and then having deeper and deeper and deeper conversations that we both help each other go deep on. Um, uh, as, as time progresses, and that's, that's the new thing that we're trying to do in terms of the intergenerational component of it. Um, there's also organizations, one of my community partners is, is an organization, Northeast Ohio Alliance for Hope, and they're actually trying to do work around racial equity and racial justice, um, and they want to actually have a racial summit, and they have task force that they're developing that both deal with kind of short-term issues, but also begin to get people to think about the long-term ramifications and also the frameworks and the paradigms that we're dealing with that may not always be articulated as such. And so they're actually doing that work on the ground, and I'm just helping. And then there are other organizations where I just go just to be, um, the National Institute for Restorative Justice in, in Cleveland, Ohio. They have book series where Mitty from the community opens up her coffee shop, has some cake and some tea and some soup, and we go and we just discuss books. And I'm a part of the community. I'm not, you know, I'm not there as, as, as Rhonda from the university. I'm there trying to learn from the folk, and I'm the folk, and we're trying to learn from each other. How do, how do, how do we do this thing? Really, how do we, again, move from the, the, the vision of freedom and the ideas and, and really deal with some of the emotional aspects of the work that we do that we don't often feel comfortable articulating in certain spaces to think about how that is going to propel and sustain us as we do this hardcore um, lifting and transformation work that we see ourselves engaged in. So I think finding those spaces in all those different ways. And so, you know, in the academy, creating the spaces, build, uh, community bridge building through the academy, if that's where you are, in community, just finding the spaces in community that you are a part of and where people are actually trying to mobilize and activate. Loretta. Um, I think the first question, quest, question the, the feasibility, viability of electoral politics with very little distinction between the Republicans and the Democratic parties. Again, I would use the old analogy of, of the proto-fascist, maybe. But I actually want to put this in a way that's closer to my heart. I rarely voted before 1994, because I had a very cynical point of view about, you know, you know, which racist did I want to support at any given time. But I went to South Africa as an election monitor, and I stood in hot sun with three days for people who were voting for the first time. And often they were standing in that sun. I was actually in Mandela's, Mandela's home province where I was, um, Umtata, I think it was called. Anyway, and I had to facilitate people voting. I had to fight with these election officials that didn't want people to vote. I mean, I had to make sure those people voted. And I promised that if I survived three days in that hot ass South African sun, I was going to vote in every election <laughs> that came my way ever since. And, you know, but in a larger context, there's struggles on many fronts. And I swear, there's enough oppression to go around. So whatever front you choose to struggle on, it's probably going to be okay, because you ain't going to run out of down pressure on that front. 
So I'm going to do the radical thing. I'm going to do the electoral thing. I'm going to do the community thing. I'm going to do the, gown, the town and gown thing. I'm going to do it all. First of all, so that I can make sure I can cover as much as I physically can. But because I don't like putting my strategies in competition with each other. I think we need to work on all those fronts. And we're short-sighted if we dogmatically stick to one. Now, on the question of white supremacy, uh, as I said very carefully, it is not a race. It is a body of ideas. And any body of ideas can be fought with another body of ideas. But you first have to admit that these ideas are working, that they are operating in our society. I think that everybody needs to learn more about white supremacy. Surprisingly, I think that black people need to learn a whole, whole lot more about white supremacy because all we do is encounter its practitioners. We don't actually encounter the people who create the white supremacist ideas or the religions that sanctify the ideas because we're actually we're caught up in those religions ourselves or the are the institutions like the Heritage Foundation that put the economic justifications for these racist ideas out there. So we don't understand the continuum of white supremacy, nor do we understand the differences even among white people. So we find ourselves doing really stupid shit like fighting, uh, uh, like practicing anti-Semitism, like that's going to help us. You know, we do a whole lot of stuff. That doesn't make sense in my mind in the struggle against white supremacy. Now, if a white person chooses to fight against white supremacy, I actually give them a lot of space and a lot of room because they're going to make a whole lot of mistakes, and I understand that. But as a black person, when I fight against white supremacy, I'm called a hero in my, in my community. When a white person fights against white supremacy, they're called a race traitor. So the costs are not different, are not the same, I mean, when I choose to fight white supremacy and a white person chooses to fight white supremacy. And I'm practical enough to understand that difference, understand that they get privileges for being white that they are choosing to reject in order to struggle with me. So I'm going to give them a whole lot of room. As a matter of fact, you know, the people that I struggle against mostly are the people who have white supremacist ideas and don't even know where they came from. I'll leave it at that. We have uh, time for a couple. Thank you. Time for uh, one or two more questions. People want to ask them. Can I can I ask the audience a question? Sure. Yeah. I'm actually wondering what the audience is thinking mm -hmm. about what is what they see as their new vision of freedom. I mean, as the questions come this way, what's the conversation also coming from the other way? What, what is it, what's the new in the new vision? Is it a new vision? Is it a vision with old content operating in new times? Obviously, historian, um, the dialectical and all of that. But what, what are you all thinking? My idea of a new vision would be one of acceptance, not merely trying to understand something is what a philosopher once told me. You're never, you're never going to understand it because you don't have all of the details. But what you can do is either accept it, that means totally immerse yourself in the process and fight for it, or you can reject it. So acceptance is going to be a clearer vision for me, for, my, for the new vision. <clears throat> no more questions? <laughs> That's right. Go ahead. Go ahead. I've been dialoguing with my colleague here, so. My answer, I, I would like to, to hear people's experiences with best, best practices that have worked. Because I've been coming to these conferences since I was 17, and it's been wonderful. And there's some people involved in them who have actually been doing work on the ground that informs their presentations, which I see here. So I think it might be helpful 
for us to hear those practices that are actually moving us towards liberation with, with a sense of confidence. I think what's missing, um, Sister Ross, because I totally agree with you, that we are more comfortable articulating what we hate but what, what, than what we are for, or what, we, what freedom would look like. I think it's a question of a crisis of confidence and consciousness. And what practices can we be involved in as organizers to inform ourselves with that sense of confidence? I remember, and I'll just be really brief, in 1970, I was a member of the African Liberation Support Committee as a black and male, terrified. I would not even tell anybody who I was. I worked my butt off. Then I went on and joined the National Black Independent Political Party and chaired a committee of it in Albany. Didn't tell anybody who I was. Finally, I landed as the National Secretary of the National Coalition of Blacks for Reparations in America and finally found my legs, and people were not put off with me. I mean, some, they tolerated me, they supported me. It's, it's not hard to do, it takes practice, but it was a question of gaining the self-confidence. I think as a people, as organizers, this is a degree of a lack of vision consciousness and self-confidence for us to to say to Barack Obama and to those who support him why that is not the best choice. And maybe we have to, I voted for him, and I may vote for him again. But in the interim, we, don't, we should not be competing with our strategies, I agree with that. We need to be building capacities so that the lesser of the two evils is no longer what we normalize, because quite frankly, it, it ends up being evil. And so, you know, that's, that's the hard piece, and what our practice is to get us there. I'm, I'm just going to push back a little bit more, brother. I believe that we are in a capitalist society that has a fundamental understanding of money and power. And until we learn to amass and use those things in a very expertise way, in a very expert way, we will not make a dent into this political or economic system. We are the masters of outrage. We are the masters of being pissed off. But we are not the masters of, of amassing our money and our power in a way to wield it like an effective sword. I've been in meetings with the Obama administration, and they will say quite baldly to you, I agree with you. I'll do everything you want me. Now show me the votes to make me do it. That's right. You know, they say that right to your face. It is not about whether they personally agree with you, but they're mastering money and power. And if you want to be in a dialogue with them and get them to do what you want them to do, it ain't about who's right. It's about who's got that money and that power who can make them, who can get their back if they do what you want them to do. It's a question of votes. So we up here talking about, I don't know about the difference between the Republicans and the Democrats and blah, blah, blah. And we're like, yeah. And because we refuse to engage in that game, that game is screwing us without a kiss. And we need to understand that. We have time for one, one, more, one more comment here. Um, hello, my name is Danielle Coleman. And <clears throat> Sister Williams, I, I definitely really appreciate that question. And, um, I feel like a lot of the room was, was, was silent for a very good reason. Um, you know, I would like to say that um, I'm angry. Um, I'm frustrated. I'm fed up. Um, not only in English, but Jean Emma in French and Brazil. I'm upset. Um, and I would like to say that um, my evolution of thought I don't think began until I was in college, which is something I'm trying to change um, in speaking with my mother. And I am strong enough to admit my privilege to say that it could have only happened in college because of how I grew up. But as a young person who was finally starting to understand uh, capitalism, um, I am so entrenched in fighting against capitalism and fighting at my school, against in, in classrooms, I'm I'm so entrenched in, in fighting. I'm always fighting that I don't I don't even you I don't know where to begin. Um, so you guys have given your visions of, of of a vision of new freedom. So I will almost turn the question back around to say, what 
what can I do? Can you give me some advice of where to begin? Because I'm so cynical and upset right now and so just trying to be a to fight against the struggle and to and to help that I don't know how to even begin to think about what I would want in a vision of of new freedom and honestly I wonder if I need to even put my time towards that when there is so much oppression I just feel like I might just stay on this track so if you can just give me some advice or your thoughts I would definitely appreciate it Okay, I'll go first. Um, you know, I, I, I hear the, 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 the quest for the kind of end vision of something, right? And I, but I also really um, kind of resist it in some respects because I don't feel like it's really in my capability to even articulate every, like what, like, like we, the world is so fucked up that I, I don't, I don't, I, I don't trust my own um, language and and symbol and vision to even be able to to, to name an endpoint, right? Like that, all, that you know, I, I don't, right? So I, so and I and I don't want us to to to, um, and that that doesn't mean that we have to kind of always only focus on what's, you know, kind of oppressing us or what's hard, right? I, you know, there's a Ziggy Marley song that says, though the world is cruel and blind, let's have a good time, right? right. And I, you know, and I very much live that way, um, you know, in some respects. But, um, I, and, and so, and I also think that sometimes where I, where my tension with a lot of the kind of politics around like these sort of broad multiracial people of color formations is that the, the desire for coalition ends up this desire for an endpoint, right? When we haven't even talked about whether we even on the same page or not, like whether what we actually think is going on is actually the same, whether we're even in the same conversation, right? Like, and I think that we have to um, be as we struggle towards some, some sort of vision of liberation, um, and we have certain kinds of senses of what that might look like and feel like, that actually sometimes knowing what you don't want is a way to get to what you want, you know? So I wonder, I actually, so I'm, I, I don't know, maybe it's, maybe I'm a, a half empty kind of person, maybe it's my Scorpio nature, I don't know. But it, you know, but I don't, um, I, I, I actually think it's, while we push sort of towards those visions, I think that what we, we end up potentially going to this kind of liberal romantic, romantic kind of romanticization and utopian vision if we haven't actually like had the kind of tension. And I think that's hard, like we don't, the problem is like to me, like we don't wanna live with that tension. But I feel like I wake up and walk out my house with that damn tension, right? I live in bed style, like this, like I, like, I, like I can't just live in a world that's about like my vision because I'm going to be stopped, right? Like that shit's going to happen. So I gotta also deal with that. Right, or I have to deal with like, you know, whatever, you know, like what a number of other things I could name right now. And I think we have to be able to um, articulate like and, and be able to live with tension and still struggle, right? And that, that to me is, 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 is where the liberation is. Um, uh, quick, last, last point. I'm getting, the, I'm getting the hook. We're all getting the hook here. But uh, Kathy, do you want to have the last Does that mean people won't be able to? We, we'll I, I continue mean, the I, conversation. I think, I think so, the pushback would yeah. be here between Kenyan and I, because I think you can, you want to, I think you can, first of all, I don't think there's an end point, right? I think there are end points that we envision. I think that there are moments of freedom in our lives every day, all the time, that if we can kind of get in touch, what, you know, where are the moments of joy? What is the struggle to bring forth a longer experience with those moments of joy um, and intimacy and connection and vision? I think that you're right that there's a tension, but I, I guess I feel like when we think about kind of the history of black freedom movements, it's always been the ability to work both with the struggle and with the possibility that has driven those movements and, and the success around those movements. So I, and I, I actually, at least in my experiences with young people, I feel like they're very clear about what they want usually. I mean, I might not always agree with it, but I, I think that they have the ability to have a sense of possibility. And I, I've often said that the, I think the good thing about intergenerational movements is that young people bring us a, a, a 
t in touch with kind of the possibility where older people like myself bring us in touch with the, the predictability of struggle, right? We've been there, we know, I think we, we understand how struggle often unfolds, but we oft sometimes lose what's possible. And I think it is, goes back to Rhonda's thing about kind of creating a space so that we're always in touch with that possibility and it may not be through us, it may be by di dialoguing with people who are able to do that type of work. Rhonda, final word. Oh, okay. <laughs> so I, I, I want to piggyback on some of what Kathy said. And, and for me, when I was listening, um, one of the first things that came to my mind was it's, it's not an end. It is a process. So for me, the whole idea of, of trying to figure out uh, what is a new, our new vision of freedom is, is, is a process. It's not just one thing that we write down and then that's what it is. But part of the process is that vision of freedom and moving through a process and knowing that we're in process, moving towards those things that we begin to identify and what that means in terms of uh, our human capacity, both to own it, to move and to struggle and, and to really deal with, again, you, you heard me so, say it several times today, but the psychic the psychic pain as well as the joy. Uh, I, re I really want to be able to sit down with some folks, and particularly folks who, you know, have been through struggle in different kinds of ways, generationally, on different levels, to talk about what we do with that. Because part, so we don't really have those conversations about the psychic and the mental and the health and the emotion and the joy and how that's all connected to justice and how we sustain ourselves through that beyond find the people who will help sustain you and you get through it. And I think we need to have a deeper conversation about what that means and how it connects to struggle um, because that's, I mean, that's real. So, so part of it is, is it's not an end game, it's, it's part of a process. I would say to the sisters, dig deep where you are. What is the question we asked at the conference? What is the critical social justice issue for you? What is the critical thing that is driving you? What is the critical thing that is concerning you? And think about the you in collectivity with the other yous and the other individuals. And then dig deep there, and that's a place to begin. Right? That's a place to get your footing. That's a place to begin to build confidence. That's a place to deal with the trauma, the psychic pain, whatever it is that you're dealing with, that's the place to begin. And I guess the other reason I asked the question is because I want to know, is it the right question? I not, only, I not only want to hear what you all think this potential new vision is for freedom, but are we asking the right question? And that's a question I have. I don't have an answer to it. That's the question. OK, and with that, we will be th bring the beginning of this conversation to an end. Thank you, Loretta and Rhonda and Kenyon and Kathy for that great panel.